very warm welcome to the third episode of our Life from the Lab series. Today we'll uncover the secret life of sea creatures by looking at um, their life cycles. My name is Siri and I'm doing my PhD project here at the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. And um, I'll give you over now to Milena who organized this event with me. She will tell you a bit more about the idea of this event series. Hi, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Milena. I am doing my PhD at the University of Exeter and the speakers in the event series are our peers and our colleagues from the USL Marie Curie Network. And what we all have in common is that we are doing biological research that involves uh, looking at animal evolution from a cell type perspective. And we also mostly have in common that we work with small marine animals and their larvae, which you will hear more about from our speakers today. And finally, an important question that uh, many of us have in our research is um, what did our ancestors look like? which is also the, the theme of the, the series overall, and uh, which you could see bits of in the trailer. So the idea of our research and the series and the trailer is that while we do not know exactly what uh, animal ancestors looked like, we do know that they were built from the same cells like we are today, and um, that is something that helps us reconstruct them. So let's dive into the topic of tonight, the secret lives of sea creatures. Tonight's speakers are Julia, Laura, Ines, and Anna. They have three things in common, probably more things as well, but uh, three things are important. They're all part of the Evocell Research Network. Second, they study animals that live in the sea. And third, they are all interested in the life cycles of their research animals. And maybe you find some more similarities and uh, commonalities throughout um, their talks. And with that, I would like now to pass you over to, the, to our scientists. Uh, Julia has the honor to begin the talks and give you the intro of this um, episode. Matt. Hello everyone, I'm Julia, and welcome to this third session of Live Talks from the Lab. As the title say, we are here live from the lab. As you can see in my background, uh, this is a film hood, and we use it uh, to manipulate uh, chemicals. But yeah, so today we're going to be talking about the research that we do in the lab. And for that, I want to show you this presentation. I'm going to share my screen. OK. OK. Can you see it? Let's hope so. OK. So yeah. Um, Today, the, the title of the talk is The Secret Lives of Sea Creatures. And um, I'm going to be talking first, introducing a bit um, the different topics that then my colleagues are going to be um, developing more. So first of all, I'd like to introduce a bit myself. So my name is Julia. I'm Spanish. But a year ago, I moved to France to uh, join this EvoCell network um, as a short-term fellow. And specifically, I'm doing my research in a marine station located in a very small village in the coast of France called Villefranche-sur-Mer. And here you can see an image of the lab. This, as you can see, it's a very beautiful building, which also has a lot of history. Actually, back in the days, it used to be a prison. And it wasn't until later that it became a marine station, thanks to its uh, very strategic location, which allows this direct access to this all marine um, ecosystem. And this is actually a photo of me, one of our coffee breaks from this exact point here. Um, and yeah, just want to say how lucky we are to be working in a place like this and enjoying this scenery every day. This is what gets us inspired. Um, and yeah, I also wanted to show you this video. And this is uh, made from the same point here that, that I showed. And these are three jellyfish of the species Pelagia, and this one of the species is studied here. And this is a, this uh, view of the bay at sunset, which is amazing. So yeah, today here from Villefranche and also other locations, we're gonna um, take you into this amazing journey of the evolution of life cycles. But what is evolution? Sorry. Evolution, maybe you've heard this word before or even seen this image. This is actually a drawing that was made by Darwin, which is one of the fathers of the theory of evolution. And he graphically represented evolution 
with this uh, drawing of a, of a tree in which each of these branches represent the connections between the ancestor and descendants and the root of the tree represent the common ancestor of all organisms. So yeah, the idea that he wanted to transmit with this uh, theory of evolution is that all animals are related to each other and had a common ancestor in the distant past. However, this is a pretty simple tree. If we were to represent all organisms that are alive on Earth today, we would, um, we would see a, a, a pretty much um, complex um, tree, something like this, where you can see all, all of these branches are species. And if we do a zoom in, um, sorry, okay. Um, you see that we are just here, we are all only one of these thousands and thousands of species that are all connected between each other and tracing back to the common ancestor. Um, so yeah, in short, evolution is what makes life possible and without evolution we would not be having all this uh, diversity and complexity of life that we see nowadays on there. And we see a diversity in shapes, in forms, in behavior, in habitat, but also a diversity in life cycles. And what is a life cycle? So we define a life cycle as the, the developmental stages that occur within an organism's lifetime. And if we look at ourselves, for example, this is the human life cycle, we can see that we have a pretty simple life cycle in a way that all of these different life stages look quite similar. We can really tell that these different forms be belong to the same organism. However, this is not always like that. That's not uh, that straightforward always. If we uh, look at other animals, for instance, these are examples that I'm sure you've seen before. Um, we find uh, that we have that there are animals with more complex life cycles. And we say complex because um, we see how these different developmental stages show different forms that look very different from one another. And even though these are the different species, um, we, if we compare these two life cycles, we see some similarities. For example, both of them have a larval stage. And a larval stage is defined as the juvenile stage, which normally looks very different from the adult and also has uh, even some structures that are specific of the larva. Um, the diet and even the habitat can be very uh, different from the adult. For instance, the tadpole is an aquatic and then the frog being terrestrial. And then on the opposite side, we have the adult, which is the definitive, definitive form and sexually mature. And how do they do this transition from this larval to adult? So this process is what it's uh, called metamorphosis. And you're actually gonna be learning more about this very soon. So yeah, these are two examples of animals with complex life cycles, but like these, there are many other organisms that also have a complex life cycle. And today we're gonna be immersing ourselves into the um, marine ecosystem. And these are the stars of tonight. Tonight you'll be learning more about the oysters, sea urchin and jellyfish life cycles. And as the examples before, they also have a complex life cycle. They go, they have this larval stage that goes through metamorphosis and forming the adult. So yeah, these are three different species belonging, belonging to different groups of animals that evolve differently, but uh, all of them have a complex life cycle. So by comparing them, we can address specific questions. For example, uh, what life stage is the ancestral form of animals? What was first, the larva or, or the adult? And this is what Laura is gonna be talking about very soon. Then how can a single organism have such dramatically different forms? This is a question that Ines is gonna be trying to answer also. And then finally, how similar are these uh, larva and adult forms when we look at them closely? For example, at the cellular level. And this is very related to Anna's PhD project and you'll uh, learn more about this very soon. So with this, uh, yeah, I'm done and, and let's uh, find out more about uh, these oysters and li life cycles. Hello everyone. So um, now it's um, my turn to speak. So um, my name is uh, Laura Piovani uh, and I'm Italian, but I live and work in London. Um, and today I'm live from, from my lab at University College London. Um, see a bit of it around me. Um, and today I'm gonna talk to you about um, the um, question of my uh, PhD project, uh, which is um, what life stage um, is ancestral um, to animals. So as Julia mentioned, different animals have different um, life cycles. 
Um, and some of them have a, a life stage called a larval stage. Um, but something she didn't say um, is that larvae of marine animals um, look a lot more similar to each other than the adults do. Um, so here I've drawn for you um, on the bottom of this slide some um, marine um, adults, um, animals, and some of these are a bit obscure, but you should be able to recognize um, on the left an oyster, uh, maybe you've eaten one at some point, and then on the right a sea urchin. Um, and on the top I've drawn the larvae of these animals, and hopefully you can see that there are some similarities, and specifically um, some of these are the fact that larvae are really small, um, uh, secondly, they have what look like a tuft of hair, uh, but it's actually made of structures called cilia. Um, I've indicated it in red. Um, and they have at the top of their body and they use it to sense the environment. And then they have one or more bands of, again, this structure called cilia, um, and they beat them um, to swim uh, in the sea. And I've indicated that um, in blue um, in my drawings. Um, but how can it be that um, animals are different as an oyster uh, and a sea urchin uh, share the similarities? Well, there's, there's two possibilities. Um, one is that the ancestor of all this animal at a larval stage, which was inherited by its descendants, uh, much in the same way in which you've inherited the color of your eyes from your parents, let's say. Um, the second possibility is that larvae were reinvented multiple times. And, and this may sound a bit strange, but actually uh, maybe there's not that many ways in which you can make a small organism that can sense the environment and, and swim in the sea. And well, why is this question interesting? Well, it's interesting because it would tell us something about what animals looked like 600 million years ago, um, and that's 400 million years before dinosaurs. So it's, it's quite a long time ago. Um, and how, how do we find out? Well, so I told you that larvae look similar and function similarly, um, but similarities in shape and function can sometimes be misleading when it comes to evolution. So if you take the example of the wings of bees and birds, um, they look similar. Um, they have the same shape and they're both used for flying. Um, but actually we know that the ancestor of bees and birds did not have wings and these were not inherited. Um, and in fact, if we look at the details of the wings of these animals, we can find a lot of differences. For example, the wings of birds are made of feathers uh, and bones and skin um, and the wings of bees are made of a substance called chitin. And so the idea is that we need to look beyond the main similarities of larvae um, to try and see if they're made up in the same way or not. Um, and because larvae are so small, that means that we have to look at the single cells that make up these larvae. Um, and this is where my project comes into place. I'm gonna compare the larvae of an oyster with that of a flatworm, uh, which split approximately 500 million years ago. So it's still quite a long time ago. Um, and I'm gonna compare the cells that make up these two animals, try and see if they are the same. Um, and um, this is a picture of me uh, actually uh, doing part of the experiment for the oyster. So I'm holding in my hand a tube uh, with cells uh, of oysters larvae. Um, and I look absolutely terrified because I was uh, terrified because this experiment is, is quite expensive. Um, anyway, once we find out if the ancestor of oysters and flatworm had a larval stage, we can compare our result with that of sea urchin um, or even jellyfish. And you will hear more about these animals um, shortly. Um, to find out what the um, ancestor of all animals uh, look like. It could be that like modern days um, marine animals it had a larval stage and an adult stage. Um, it could be that larvae actually evolved multiple times and the ancestor did not have a larval stage. Maybe it looked more like a worm. But it could even be that the ancestor of all these animals actually was a small larva um, that swam in the sea. Um, and now there's just a small peek into what I'm doing now. So as I told you, I'm trying to compare the cells of flatworms and oyster larvae. And here I'm showing you um, just the results for the flatworm. Um, so in this graph here um, on the left, each dot um, is a cell. Um, and then each color and number represent a group of cells that are more similar to each other than the rest. Um, and what we can do is that we can take um, a group of cells, for example, 29 here, and we can ask what gene uh, do these cells use? And so for example, here I'm showing you there's this gene, aropsin, um, is only used by the cells um, in this group. And what's even cooler is that I can take that gene and highlight it in the animal, which is what I do in here. So in red, you can see uh, the expression of the gene aropsin, and then in blue, you see the nuclei of all the other cells. Um, and these cells are actually the eye spots um, of the larva. So this larva has three um, eye spots. There's another one in the back, but this gene is only expressed in this two that you can see here. Um, now the oyster actually don't have um, eyes, the, the oyster larvae, um, and so we can't actually compare that specific cell, 
Um, but this is the idea behind what I'm doing. And I thought this was a pretty cool example. So I should show it to you. And yeah, so thank you all for listening. And, and I'll pass it on to Ines, who's going to talk to you about um, sea urchin um, and metamorphosis. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. So yeah, um, today, unfortunately, I cannot be at the lab. So I put a picture of my lab behind me to show you guys what it would be like. This is actually the bench where I would normally work and I'm wearing lab coat. So at least hopefully I can make up for it uh, with my talk because uh, unfortunately I can't be there tonight for uh, circumstances that we all are aware of. <laughs> so let me share my screen. So today I will talk to you about, uh, well, first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ines Furnon and I'm from Spain, but I'm talking to you from, from Naples, from Italy. And I normally work at Stazione Zoologica and Dondorn. And I will talk to you about metamorphosis and in particular, the metamorphosis of sea urchin. So from egg to the sea urchin that we all know. First, uh, let me talk about body plan transition. So metamorphosis is a type of body plan transition that happens in a single lifetime. And today we've already heard a little bit about metamorphosis and the classical examples like from a caterpillar to a butterfly or from a tadpole to a frog. Or maybe you've read about metamorphosis in books like Frank Kafka's Metamorphosis. And those are very cool types of metamorphosis and many animals have metamorphosis, which is exciting. And unfortunately, humans, we don't really go through a metamorphosis. We go through a body plan transition like during puberty, but nothing as dramatic as we will see today. The sea urchin adult is this, and this is the uh, protagonist of the story tonight. Um, the sea urchins belong to a group called echinoderms, which literally means spiky skin for very obvious reasons. But some of you might know them from eating them in pasta if you're Italian or maybe at a sushi restaurant. Um, but however, this is what the larva of a, a sea urchin looks like if you have asked yourself and it doesn't look at all like a sea urchin. So this is what it looks like at the start is we have the egg and then we have the sperm, the fertilization occurs and during a series of cell divisions, the larva appears, which is this um, weird shaped uh, animal that basically just floats around the, the plankton, the, the water column in the ocean, and it just eats uh, microalgae. And then you might ask, like, how does this um, upside down Eiffel Tower thing turn into a sea urchin, like a spiky ball? So bear with me. Uh, and this is a very important question because essentially if we think about it, it's almost like we have two different animals and one genome, like two different animals with different cells and suddenly they, they go through a transition and separate those lives. So how it happens essentially, uh, the larva that I just told you about, it grows and a section within the larva starts appearing and this section, it will zoom into it actually it's basically a sea urchin inside it, a small sea urchin like we see here. And this is called the rudiment. And essentially, let me explain to you what that would mean like in, if we compare it in humans. So we know what the human looks like. So we have the, uh, an adult with the child inside it. So it's the mother carrying the baby, the baby's born and the baby basically grows. Obviously it goes through puberty and all that. So think about what it would be like to be a sea urchin from a human point of view. So you have a larva, which will be the baby. And inside the baby, there is a adult version of the baby. So your adult self. And inside that baby, the adult self grows. And at some point, the adult self basically pops out. And it pops out, not only does it just pop out, it actually eats the larva, it actually eats the baby which is really gnarly if you think about it, but that is literally what it does for substance for the first few days after metamorphosis. And then the new adult, basically the juvenile first, grows into the sea urchin. So this is what it literally looks like. First, like I, I explained it to you, we have a transition kind of stage in which we have both the larva and the um, sea urchin. We have those two little 
antennae kind of things. And they're actually the tube feet that the sea urchin looks like, uh, uses for moving around. And then it goes through a small uh, some stages where it, it basically grows and, and the appendages become more prominent. And then it, it becomes a sea urchin that we all know and love. And to give you some perspective again, like when it just goes through metamorphosis, this is how small it is. And then it grows into a pretty big animal. And it takes a long time for them to grow, by the way. So what do I do in terms of research? I look at a type of a group of cells that are very important. These cells appear like very soon after fertilization, after a few uh, stages of cell division. And these cells actually are the ones that then give rise, uh, that, that basically go into this section of the larva that then becomes the juvenile. So basically these cells make it all the way through metamorphosis, they survive. And then we actually think that those cells, there is some evidence that those cells contribute to very important uh, cells in the adult, like the sperms and the eggs, which are the ones that then give rise to the next generation. So the very important cells and the way we do the, we study them, First, we take a special kind of uh, molecular dye and we label these cells. So this is what it looks like. At uh, 15 hours after we fertilize the eggs, we label them. And this is what the actual uh, embryo looks like with the labeling. And then we take the embryos and we split them into single cells. And then we can take the fluorescent cells, which are the ones that we are interested in. And we basically, uh, extract the RNA from those cells. And then we can actually then look at it in, in the computer. We have the, the sequence data, and then we can understand what genes are inside those cells and how those cells are important or not, and what do they actually do at the gene level, which is a lot of information is, it's kept there. And essentially, my work contributes to learning how the sea urchin is built and how the communication between organs, tissues, genes, cells, and how basically from one body to another body and from one animal from the larva to another animal, the adult, and how the transition happens and learn how those quirky animals uh, came about on earth and which came first, the larva or the adult. Uh, thank you so much and hopefully stay curious because now we're going to move on to Anna, who will tell us about uh, jellyfish. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ines. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna, and uh, I'm doing my PhD in the same lab uh, that Julia showed you before in the south of France, in villefranche sur mer uh, today I'm going to talk about jellyfish, that is the focus of my PhD project, and actually here with me I have a tank with my model organism, I don't know if you can see it, but let me start my presentation so I can show you what we have in this tank here. So the jellyfish uh, that is the focus of my project is called Clitia hemispherica, and uh, in this video you can recognize uh, most of the common feature for a jellyfish, like this hemispherical bell and the mouth in the center, the reproductive organs, and on the edge of the bell, these long tentacles full of stinging cells. Um, in the lab, we uh, keep males and females, and they release their gametes every day at the sunrise. Here, I have a picture of a female releasing the eggs in the water. So these eggs gets fer get fertilized and uh, from the embryo, we get a larva, a swimming uh, larva. So this uh, animal, this, this life stage is capable of swimming because uh, the body is covered by cilia that are the same cilia that Laura has in her larvae. And um, so the larva is capable to swim around only for three days before undergoing to a drastic metamorphosis that I'm showing you here, in which it flattens down on the surface and then elongates in this uh, completely different form that is called a polyp. The polyp can uh, grow and grow and uh, form this uh, heterogeneous uh, colony that can cover uh, the seabed um, or rocks or shells, even shells. Um, in details, uh, the form of polyps that we find in the colony are these two. The one on the right that seems like a flower is uh, the form of polyp that is capable of feeding and maintaining the colony uh, alive, 
while the one on the right, uh, on the left, sorry, the bean-like structure, um, it, it, it has another, a completely different job. That is the one of releasing the baby jellyfish uh, in the sea. And then, so they can grow up uh, until reaching the sexual maturation. Uh, all the life cycle can be, can last until um, around, let's say, a couple of months. And as you can see, they are completely different animals. They, they look like completely different animals. Um, let's talk a bit about proportion. You could not see uh, the jellyfish uh, that I have here in the tank because they're very, very small and transparent. They can only grow up uh, and up to one uh, centimeter. The, the larvae are almost invisible, only 0 0.2 millimeters, and the polyp colony cannot grow uh, taller than one centimeter. For my PhD uh, project, I'm interested in the adult and the larva, and I'm uh, interested in uh, understand which are the cells that uh, characterize these two animals. To do this, I'm uh, looking inside each single cell, and I'm looking inside in, at the genetic material that this cell uh, contains. Uh, furthermore, um, I'm interested also in compare these uh, cells that characterize uh, each form of this uh, life cycle uh, in order to understand if uh, maybe the jellyfish has some cells that the larva doesn't have or the other way around. Um, but why uh, these, these animals are so fascinated, fascinating and interesting for scientists? Well, in, in this picture, you can uh, for sure recognize the, uh, the pink one, the pink jellyfish on, uh, on the right. And uh, it's important to know that not all of them have the same life cycle. So uh, they have a really uh, incredible diversity of life cycle. Some of them uh, don't have the polyp stage. Some of them uh, have a different way to uh, make the jellyfish and uh, they are all grouped together in an evolutionary branch that is called Cnidaria, together with um, corals and sea anemones. Uh, but they have also another important meaning for scientists, they, uh, and it's an evolutionary meaning. They um, separated from uh, another group that includes most of the animals, including our ancestor, around 600 million years ago. So it's quite a long time uh, ago. And uh, we actually don't know what was uh, the common ancestor before. So we don't know what the ancestor uh, looked like. And in the context of the Evo cell, uh, knowing uh, which cell characterized the, um, the medusa in this case, the, the jellyfish in this case, and uh, knowing also uh, from other uh, projects, which are the cells that uh, characterized the other different animals on, on the tree of life, we can compare uh, all this information and hopefully understand something more about what the common ancestor looked like. And with this, I want to thank everyone for listening and for coming this evening. And with Julia, uh, Ines and Laura, we are happy to take any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you for this, uh, this very really nice four talks and uh, with that I would like to start now the question round and um, yes please ask questions you can do that in the YouTube chat as well as in the Zoom chat. I think I'll just start off, um, start off with one for Laura and uh, in our first episode of uh, this series we talked about fossils uh, specifically also it's about the Cambrian explosion. So the Cambrian explosion is a, is a time period where uh, that is from around uh, 540 um, million years ago. And it's a period where a lot of uh, animals suddenly appeared at different animal types. And um, Laura, you have some kind of connection to this time period. And I would like to ask you, um, how is your research connected to the Cambrian explosion? Yeah, so it's it's quite a cool um, idea. Is that um, the because in the during the Cambrian explosion we see a lot of animals appearing all of a sudden. Well, I say all of a sudden. It's still quite a long time compared to you know 
at human time scales, but um, it's a short time evolutionary speaking. And we see the main group of animals that we can see nowadays appearing uh, quite shortly one after the other. Um, and there's this idea that we don't know if uh, these animals appeared previously um, and then did not fossilize for a while for, for whatever reason. Um, uh, Graham spoke about this during the, the first meeting um, and hopefully you can rewatch that on YouTube um, if you have the chance, uh, if you weren't there. Um, but, but, but one of the theories um, of why they didn't fossilize is that maybe the ancestor of all this animal uh, were larvae um, and so they were so small um, that they, they wouldn't fossilize. Um, and for a while this was, uh, a lot of scientists thought that this was possible. I'm not 100% sure that this is still um, the case now. Um, I think we probably think that it might more, be more probable that the, the, the common ancestor maybe was more of a worm. Um, uh, but, um, but it's a quite cool, uh, quite cool theory. Um, and ultimately finding out uh, if these larvae are related to each other and if the ancestor had a larval stage could, could help us um, answering that question. So I uh, have uh, another question for you, Anna, um, which is um, um, when you compare the larvae and the medusae, um, what are the cells that you expect to find in both of them? Um, so uh, we are still in the process of um, collecting the data and analyzing the data, especially for the larva, uh, but um, I can a bit speculate about it. Uh, for example, uh, one um, one different thing that is that there is between the jellyfish and the larva is that the jellyfish is capable of uh, of eat while the larva uh, doesn't. So I I can expect that maybe. So what what I expect is that uh, I can find like uh, a pretty complex uh, digestive system with all digestive cells. Um, in the in the jellyfish, but maybe uh, not not in the in the planula. And uh, in common, uh, of, of course, that there will be some uh, neurons in in common. Uh, maybe in the planula, we will have some um, not very very well differentiated neurons because of the difference in behavior. Uh, so yeah. Thank you. All right, there's another question uh, on the Zoom from uh, Sarah and it's to Ines. Uh, yeah, so hypothetically speaking, if one would remove the adult sea urchins, uh, so the adult sea urchin and, and so the cells from the larvae before the sea urchin starts eating the larvae, would it be possible to keep both separated forms alive? Hi, uh, thanks for the question. So let me think, uh, probably not. Um, you probably wouldn't be able to remove it at a stage in which you could keep both alive because essentially it's, first of all, like it gets to a point in which like it's so late, like it, basically the larva, it's so prepared and it has prepared all this pocket of cells that it's basically rejuvenile that not only that section of the larva, it's it's basically the juvenile anymore. Like there's other sections that start changing into, into a juvenile. So if you were to remove that section of the larva, you would essentially like um, kill the both both forms. So you, that, that you can't really do. I have done my, the sections of it, so I, I, I can remove it, but I either destroy either or destroy the other. Like it, you, you couldn't do it. However, you can't remove the cells uh, that then become the, the adult sea urchin very early on. And the, the rest of the cells actually uh, communicate and they basically substitute those cells. So there is a mechanism in which the cells notice that you've removed those important cells and they make up for it. So they basically quickly rearrange themselves and make sure that they are replaced. So that's something that is done, but it's very much earlier on. You can't do it at the point that it's like too late. Basically, you would end up with nothing. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. 
All right, another question um, from Emily. And she has a practical question uh, for Ines about sea urchins. So what is the method for labeling relevant cells and how are they made fluorescent? So um, we use a specific uh, molecule that is called calcine and it sounds a lot like um, calcium because it's, because it's actually um, a molecule that you can find on cells that make uh, bones or like uh, skeleton structures in some animals like in sea urchins, so calcine. And uh, in this case, this is a type of a fancy type of calcium. Like uh, we, we buy this from a, a company that makes uh, supplies for, for labs. And, it and it's a type of calcium that is not fluorescent until basically you put it, you put it basically in the water with the, with the embryos. And the embryos basically take that molecule that is floating in the water through like the membranes of the cells. And once it's inside the cells, because it there's a process in which when you allow a cell to, to put a molecule outside, inside the cell, there's a change at the, within, within, the, within the molecule that it basically becomes fluorescent. Like it's designed, this is all artificial by the way. This is not something that you just find floating uh, in, the, in, in the natural um, environment. But we take advantage of, of this very uh, nice molecule and basically those cells, the specific ones that we're interested in, they can take the molecule in, but they can't take the molecule out. Whereas the rest of the cells in the animal, they're able to push the molecule out. So basically the fluorescent goes away, whereas it remains in the cells that we're interested in. And also we use a type of inhibitor. So like a drug that stops the, the molecule that is fluorescent to go out of the cells that we're interested in essentially. It's kind of complex, but essentially it's just, we put the dye in, in the water and the cells take it themselves. So they do the job for us. I hope that also uh, answers your question. All right. And then there's some um, bit more uh, philosophical question maybe, or I think it can be meant in many different ways. And uh, there are probably also many different answers to that. Uh, why is this kind of, research interesting for us and uh, I, i'd say maybe like especially for us as humans but also why is it interesting um why is it useful um, maybe someone can answer that of you yeah maybe okay i'll i'll give a, an answer um my answer um so yeah first as a evolutionary developmental biologist this is kind of super interesting to us uh, to know as I, we talk about evolution and how everything is related and we are all coming from this common ancestor. So by learning more about these animals that are um, um, maybe not um, more accessible to uh, um, for us to uh, study kind of in a um, deeply compared like to human, we can go uh, deeply uh, into uh, things that maybe we cannot um, study in humans. For instance, if we think about these cell types that we, we say that are shared um, be because uh, um, we are all connected, um, by studying them in, in these animals, we can um, get more, know more about these cells and then this can be applied to to also humans knowing more about more uh, about the nervous system can be also um, somehow uh, then um, translated to humans. This kind of the application when thinking about humans, but then there's also kind of a, for example, a very interesting ecological application that could be, uh, for example, thinking about these animals that need, need to go through the metamorphosis to form the adult. And like, for example, a clear example is corals. Corals need to have this larval stage, and then um, uh, to to to, uh, to form the adult, they need to to go through this metamorphosis. So, by knowing how this happens, we can um, and then apply it to some restoration, for example, um, well, restoring corals. Um, yeah, that would be kind of this more ecological um, application. But yeah, I'm sure my friends have also other interesting answers. 
I think um, Judy answered really well, really. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, for us, it's very interesting um, as evolutionary biologists to compare. So there's two things we can do to find out about the ancestor uh, of animals. And one is looking at fossils. Uh, but when uh, we don't have fossils, um, and also fossils are quite rare and are hard to, um, and some parts of fossils are hard to study. For example, cells, uh, you, you can't really find out what molecules are inside cells uh, just by looking at fossils. And so the only other way we have um, to study ancestors is to compare the animals that live nowadays um, and try to find out what they have in common and whether it's possible that the ancestor had this shared similarities as well. Um, what, but I guess the, the, the more hard question is how is this useful for humans? Um, and I think Julia um, answered quite well to that, to that part too, but sometimes there's a lot of, of research, of basic research that does not have a clear um, utility that you can see straight away, uh, but sometimes in the process of, of studying other things you come across um, really interesting uh, molecules or techniques that then you can apply to things that are actually useful for humans. Um, and I think there's a lot of example of this. And I think uh, at, there's an episode that will speak a bit more about it. Is that next week? Maybe Siri, you can, I cannot remember dates. <laughs> yeah, I was about to mention that uh, next week on Tuesday, um, exactly in one week, at 7 p.m. we will talk a bit more about practices. Uh, so it's uh, about uh, practice, uh, especially in and um, during like cyber age. And um, Konstantinas will talk talk or tell us a bit more about the importance of basic research and uh, and what you can do and how it can be applied um, within um, medicine and other sorts of uh, ways. Yeah. Milena, do you want to go for next question? Yeah, unless anyone else has something uh, philosophical to say. No? Um, so um, I um, have a question for um, Julia to keep it uh, light because you, did, you just started recently and um, um, it, it would be cool if you could tell us more about uh, uh, what you're going to be doing, what your research plans are, and um, um, yeah, what's your project going to be like? Yeah, so I just started the PhD actually here in the lab, and my topic of research is very related to metamorphosis. I'm studying larval settlement in cnidarians, and actually we talk today about cnidarians, and I showed this jellyfish and this group that yeah includes the jellyfish, the corals, and also the sea anemones. So I'm I'm going to be studying the the settlement, which is this process that happens before uh, metamorphosis, in which the larvae um, attaches to the to the substrate. The larvae needs to find this um, spot uh, on the substrate to to attach, and then after this settlement, the metamorphosis can happen. So kind of my interest um, is uh, to compare these processes between uh, the jellyfish, which is the one that Anna showed, and then uh, coral species or several coral species, um, and compare how this, this uh, happens, whether there's the same genes or different genes, uh, molecules, and then um, um, also this, um, well, the application that I was talking about could be uh, this interest in the ecological part of, of how, um, how does it, um, how can the, the settlement um, happen? And then um, by knowing this, maybe we can um, act on um, coral restoration. Yeah, in some, well, this ecological. <laughs> so yes, uh, I'll be doing this, this uh, next three years. Yeah, that is really cool settlement, isn't it? <laughs> logically important process. Okay, I have another one. Alex asks, hi, I have a question for Anna. You said jellyfish uh, release the gametes at sunrise. Is this because they detect the sun or would their body clock still cause them to release gametes at sunrise even if they were hidden away in a lab with no sunlight? 
Okay, thank you. This is uh, very interesting and it's actually uh, something that has been studied in, in the lab here. Um, so uh, there is, um, so the, the jellyfish have a way uh, to uh, sense the light uh, through uh, a molecule called opsin uh, that can uh, communicate with other molecules and then uh, induce uh, this uh, releasing of the, the gametes, the, the eggs for the females and uh, the sperm for the, for the males. So if we, mm, if we keep them in the dark, they, they are not gonna release any, any eggs or any sperm. Uh, and what we do uh, basically in the lab is um, like we can, we can um, keep, so the, the, the light cycle uh, as as much as we uh, as we can as we want, uh, and so with this we mm, it's it, it, mm, so this is a feature that is very uh, helpful for us you know, in order to uh, to to do the actual experiment to collect the eggs at the right time and uh, to to then uh, have the time to uh, develop the larva uh, in three two or only one day. So yeah, Flickia is is very useful for for these kind of things. So thank you. All right, I will go on with my question. And uh, so you're all working in um, laboratories, and uh, I'm sure there are, it's pretty interesting to know what kind of research you do. But I also think you might have some funny or weird stories of uh, if something goes wrong in the lab. Um, does any one of you have? <laughs> some story to tell? Well, many things go wrong all of the time. Sometimes <laughs> what the things that go wrong are the things that go wrong. I was going to say the same. <laughs> but um, uh, I have a funny story. So um, at the beginning of my PhD, um, I wanted to find a way to make oysters uh, release uh, sperm and eggs. So they, unfortunately, they're not as synchronized as uh, Ecclesia. They, they don't care about the sun. Um, and, um, and so I was, and apparently a change in temperature helps them to release um, sperm and eggs, but that didn't uh, work for me uh, whenever I tried. Um, and so actually someone in the network um, who might be here tonight, Andy, um, suggested that sometimes vibration um, could excite the oysters and make them release um, eggs and sperms. And he suggested that I should try and lightly drill them with an electric drill. Now, this was not hurting the animals at all. I was just like putting the drill on the top of the shell and the shell is really hard. Um, and theoretically that was supposed to make them happy and make them spawn. And so I had to go around uh, UCL and convince someone to lend me a, a drill um, to try and excite the oysters. And um, I need to tell you that that, that didn't work. Um, they, they still didn't spawn. Um, but, but thanks, Andy, because that was that was fun. that was a fun a fun day at the in the lab. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> um, there's another question of uh, Alex, um, and it's uh, directed to everyone. Uh, how long did it take you to learn the husbandry of your model organisms, and how much of your day would you dedicate for this? I can answer that. Um, I think it depends a lot on, on what lab and how lucky you are. If you have a technician that does that for you, some people are lucky enough and some people have to learn. Like I, not so much taking care of the adults. So thankfully we have a, a, where I work at Satyana Zoologica. It's also has a part of a, an, a, a public aquarium, but you know that because I know you work there. Um, so obviously there is people who take care of the adults. Uh, I do go down and actually feed them. I feed them um, sweet corn because it's high in protein and they really like it. And for some time I fed them also egg whites, boiled egg whites, to just have them uh, happy in a high protein diet. Because um, if you feed them only um, algae, they don't, they're not as happy. Um, and then in the case of the, the larva, which we keep in, in upstairs in the lab in, in a different incubator room, and the juveniles, that I've done and learned all by myself. And it takes a long time because, I mean, my, my colleagues today, like 
who presented. They, they, it's quite hard to take care of larvae. There's so many things that can go wrong. And if you have a aquarium or a beak uh, with, with the larva and something goes wrong, everything dies inside the aquarium. So it's really sad and when it happens, but it happens somewhat often, especially when you start. And then it's just a matter of putting a lot of patient into it, patience into it, especially for myself that I have to, I sometimes have like monthly long uh, or even the months long of, um, of the same cultures that I have to keep them because if I'm growing the juveniles for a long time, it's a, it's a long process essentially. And in my case, I had to learn it. And sometimes it's uh, the tough way, the way you learn. <laughs> But you do always get uh, um, a lot of help with that because um, it's uh, uh, you're not the only person using the animal culture and it is in everyone's best interest uh, that they stay alive. Uh, so, yeah, if uh, if uh, you're asking Alex because you want to start in research, that is uh, not something to worry about. You will get lots of help. Yeah. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, we don't work along a lab so everybody's there to help you never you never learn entirely by yourself essentially and also oysters are great you go and buy them at the market at the soup you know at the fish market and then you put them in a we put them in the aquarium under the sea urchin and they just filter the water that the sea urchins are in and they're just doing fine they just left them there and they're happy um so some, some animals require a bit less work than others um do you all do you get all your animals from the fish market, Laura? Uh, no. So so for the flatworms, we um, we go and collect them in Florida. Um, I've only been once because um, I was supposed to go again this year, but obviously, um, and it was amazing. It's a really lovely trip. Uh, we go to the Florida Keys and get to snorkel around um, looking for flatworms. And there's a surprising amount of them, um, and then we we take them back to said London <laughs> for them um, but but yeah but the oysters are just in I don't know if you've ever been to London but it's a borough market which is a fancy market um, near London Bridge um, and we just just go and buy them I would go back to the domain of like slightly philosophical um, for a bit and um, this is a, a question that I think um, all of you can answer or, or can speculate at, and it is, why do some animals go through metamorphosis? So in terms of like a pattern that you see a lot in a lot of animals that have uh, metamorphosis, you have two separate animals almost and two separate objectives of each uh, animal form. So for example, um, it's very extreme with some insects. Uh, for example, you have uh, a larva form that basically feeds for a long time and it is the longest time of, of the animal and, and of the entire cycle and it feeds. And then once it goes through metamorphosis, it basically its uh, only objective is to reproduce and to have uh, descendants. So it happens with, uh, I think, uh, nymphs. Uh, they basically, once they do metamorphosis, they, I think they live for like a few hours and then they die as they reproduce and they die. So that's a very extreme one. And metamorphosis, it's good because it separates the two and it has, one is feeding and that's the only purpose and one is reproducing and that's the only purpose. And you have specialized organs for each stage and specialized objectives. So I think in that sense, evolution, that's how it, it was selected for, for certain animals, it was more, an advantage to have those two uh, separate uh, objectives in life and then have metamorphosis in between to separate it. I, I think that's one of the reasons, if you look at it from a biological point of view, at least. That's. Yeah, also answers the meaning of life. <laughs> yeah, reproduction and feeding. <laughs> I, I wonder how. Uh... Yeah, I wonder why we sometimes can't do metamorphosis. Be interesting. And uh, Milena, would you like to continue with the question? Yes, and uh, I think I'll stick um, with um, the the big questions. And uh, the the next one is for Anna, and that is, uh, are Medusa immortal? 
<laughs> okay, uh, this is this is an interesting question. So if we uh, talk about like let's let's talk about clipia and uh, the um, jellyfish is 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 not immortal, so it can um, live for around uh, one month one month and a half, at least here in the lab. Um, but the polyp colony is uh, potentially immortal in, in the sense that um, it, can, it can grow. So if, of course, if, it, if we feed the polyp colony, it can uh, constantly uh, grow and replace the dead parts with new parts of colonies. Uh, so the answer to the question is, no, the jellyfish is not immortal, but the poly, poly, the poly colony um, is potentially immortal. And uh, anyway, there is a jellyfish uh, that we don't study here uh, that uh, is called Turritopsis, that it's um, addressed as a, an immortal jellyfish because it can uh, go back to the polyp stage every time it gets damaged and or, or it's like in some in, con in condition of starvation uh, or like disadvantageous condition. So uh, jellyfish have very, very different features and uh, they're very interesting from this point of view. Yeah, they definitely are. Okay, thank you. I think with that, uh, we reached our end. And um, thank you to you all who made it here. And uh, we hope to see you again next Monday, where we will um, talk about, uh, hear a bit more about the nervous system and the brain and its evolution. And um, uh, yeah, thank you from me. And uh, uh, Milena, would you like to say final word as well? Uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, it uh, is uh, really nice to be able to share our research with everyone. And uh, I would also like to thank um, all our speakers for today for for preparing such interesting talks. See you next Thank Monday. You. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye everyone.